and gold keeps on rising to new all-time record highs. It's around 2400 as I'm recording this. Silver is just past $29. Uh, once we get to 30 and push higher than that, once we break 30, basically, uh, we could be in 1979. I've said we're in late 1978 when it comes to the gold and silver markets. And once silver pushes past 30, uh, and silver broke to new highs in 1979, so that would be the rough technical equivalent. Uh, then we'd be starting 1979, which is when things really got heated up. I don't know if that's what's going to happen this time, but we're getting really close. It is now a race between what looks to be World War III and the dollar collapsing because, you know, in today's news recap, silver to ride coattails of gold's record prices. Silver has the most potential to benefit from a sustained rally in gold among the precious white metals, reckon UBS analysts. Silver has started to gather some attention in early second quarter following the relentless rally in gold to new all-time highs. With many investors caught off guard by the speed and magnitude of gold's ascent, silver has been offering market participants a chance to catch up. We think it is still early days, with silver's year-to-date outperformance still relatively muted compared with its historical behavior. Investment demand and green technology trends could help to drive silver's demand. UBS added, as could wider risk on sentiment in the wake of interest rate cuts, while higher volatility is likely to also attract more active investor participation. Now we'll show you more clips. Like, subscribe, and share this video with a gold bug to support the channel. We're going to start with the, uh, the inflation, the CPI inflation statistics that came out on, was it Thursday? It was yesterday. It was Thursday. And I want to focus on a part of it that not many people focus on. So this is, I've done this before, I've uh, gone through this before on Silver Reports. So it's the sticky price inflation indicator. This is put out by the Atlanta Fed, headed by, I think, Rafael Bostic, who is my namesake, and I'm very proud of that. We're very closely related. So anyway, the sticky price inflation is composed of stuff that doesn't change price very frequently or easily. And I didn't zoom in on this, but you can take my word for it. This little orange line is the sticky price inflation and is now at 4.5% annual from 4.4% uh, in February, or was it? Yeah, in February it was 4.4 and now it's 4.5. So we have first uptick in sticky price inflation, the biggest component of which is owner's equivalent rent, which isn't even a price of anything that exists, um, but it changes the prices. It changes price the slowest and it has the highest weight on the sticky price inflation indicator matrix, whatever we want to call this. So we're headed back up on this metric. Uh, this, I think where we are here on this is somewhere in 1977, 1978, when we saw the second wave of inflation. And I wanted to get into that second wave for a second by reading this article from Yahoo Finance. This is entitled, Why the Fed Risks Relearning the Painful Inflation Lessons of the 1970s. Uh, and this is from Jared Blickery, the only guy that I trust on Yahoo Finance. He is sympathetic to the Austrian school, and he wrote something that I didn't even realize. He writes here, as Apollo Global Management Chief Economist Torsten Slock noted to clients, the year-over-year -year change in super core inflation, super core, is now running at 5%, whatever that means. I don't know what super core inflation. It sounds really awesome, though. While the three-month change has jumped to 8%, not far from its early 2022 peak, which was then a 40-year high. So yeah, super core, I guess you could call that sticky or something like that or something close to it. It's headed higher. Uh, and this is uh, Apollo Global Management sounding the warning on inflation. Now here, Jared Blickey writes, the Fed aims to avoid repeating the double inflation episode that rocked the 1970s and early 1980s. That was that inflection point that I noted on the sticky price inflation chart uh, that I just showed you. Uh, we're around there, 1977, 1978, could be 1979, depends exactly, nothing is exact. Here he writes, after price inflation spiked at 12% in 1974, the Arthur Burns-led Fed was quick to keep the policy rate relatively low, even as inflation rose again. So the policy rate is still relatively low because real interest rates are still very, very low, even though they're positive. Positive doesn't mean high. He writes about Volcker, and this I didn't realize about Volcker. In 1979, after price inflation poked above 10% again, Paul Volcker, notice how he uses the term price inflation, Jared Brickley, and not inflation. You see how he's sympathetic to the Austrian school, and he's trying to keep his definitions relatively straight. 
I commend him for that. Paul Volcker was installed as Fed chair to put the inflation genie back in the bottle for good. But even Volcker got it wrong. This is key. In these early days as Fed chair, less than a year into his eight-year tenure, the Fed funds rate stood north of 20%. As CPI peaked to 15%, the Volcker Fed quickly lowered the policy rate to 9% over a few months, only to throttle it to 20% in 1980. From there, the Fed dropped it to 16%. But the central bank was again forced to raise the benchmark to 20%. The third time in just over a year. So Volcker raised rates three times to 20%. Uh, and only the third time did the price inflation statistics get knocked down for long enough that he was safe in cutting rates. But the thing is, there is no way, no possible way, even if Volcker was chairman now, there'd be no possible way for him to do anything because raising rates to anything close to that will bankrupt the entire planet. Because the entire planet is based on the dollar. And the dollar is 93% backed by treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. So uh, raise rates and the dollar goes down. We'll get to that in the last slide. But let's continue with these slides. Now, people have been asking me, is it a good time to get into the miners? Should, am I chasing price? Is it too risky? Well, look, you could be chasing price, but is that really such a bad thing relatively? I mean, that depends on your financial situation. I'm not giving any advice to anybody, but I'm just showing you that... Uh, mining stocks, including our sponsor, Fortuna Silver Mines, which you will get to in a minute, uh, they are still incredibly low priced relative to the, uh, to the uh, price of gold here. Uh, we see that this is the Huey to spot gold ratio. The lower it is, the lower that gold stocks are priced relative to the price of gold. We have a tiny, tiny little rally here, but really it's, it's nothing. We haven't even gotten to the 2008 lows yet. Uh, so in a, in a, from a long-term perspective, uh, the gold stocks are still incredibly <laughs> undervalued. And when does that change? It changes when gold has a rally relative to other commodities and we become, come into a monetary crisis, at which point I believe this will correct itself very quickly and spectacularly. Um, it could be something like this in 2008, but in the opposite direction, right? We saw here from 2000, from the gold bottom until 2004, the prices of gold stocks rose about by a factor of six right, from about 0 0.1, 0 0.15 to 0 0.65, something like that. Uh, so a factor of five or six in, what was it, three, less than three years, about three years. Uh, so we're going to see something similar to that, but I think even more extreme. And, uh, you know, do your own uh, research and consider your own finances, but this is what I think. That brings us to our sponsor for this silver report and that is fortuna silver mine symbol fsm april 8th fortuna reports strong gold equivalent production of 112,543 ounces in the first quarter of 2024 uh i just wanted to note some of the highlights here so we have 40 million dollars paid back on the company's credit facility resulting in a total 121 million dollars paid since q3 of 2023 it's best to get rid of debt now or lower it as much as possible for interest rates really skyrocket gold equivalent production a 20 percent increase compared to q1 2023 and a 17 percent decrease compared to q4 2024 i think that has to do with their silver mines in Mexico and some kind of labor dispute, so I don't think it was endemic to the company. Uh, gold production of 89,678 ounces, a 49% increase compared to Q1 2023. So here we see that, yes, the decrease in gold equivalent ounces is due to a drop in silver production. Segela is really taking over, and FSM, Fortuna Silver Mines, is becoming um, very gold-focused, which I think is pretty wise in this environment. And it will, of course, maintain its exposure to silver as well, making it a pretty good mix. And one of my favorites, this is just my personal opinion. This is not advice. Nothing is. Silver set for banner year as investors bet on precious metals. Silver crossed $28 per ounce this week and is seen reaching as high as $32 by the end of 2024 amid expectations that interest rates in the U.S. could stay higher for longer. In part due to safe haven demand amid geopolitical tensions, the silver price, which is about 40 percent below its $48 per ounce peak in 2011, has jumped along with gold prices in recent days, with gold hitting an all-time high price of $2,365 per ounce on Tuesday. Silver started to move in earnest last autumn, rather like gold, just as financial markets started to wonder whether the U.S. economy was running hotter than expected, with 
with the result that inflation could run higher for longer than expected, a view which gained further currency last week with the strong American non-farm payrolls numbers. Throw in rampant U.S. government spending and how inflation on the other side of the Atlantic seems to be reaccelerating, and investors and traders may be on the hunt for stores of value once more. Mold believes silver may catch the eye of contrarians even more than gold, which is at new all-time highs above $2,300 per ounce. Now we're going to go into Costco, and yeah, I've actually got one of these. I have a 2.5 gram one, not a one ounce one. This is a PAMP thing. Somebody gave it to me as a gift. So anyway, Costco run on gold starting. Now, the numbers in here are not that impressive. However, I will show you something that is impressive in the next slide. PAMP it. PAMP apparently is a brand of gold, something with a girl with like seashell hair. I don't know what that is. Is that some kind of Persian goddess or something? Uh, Ishtar, maybe? Uh, PAMP it. Costco selling up to 200 million dollars in gold bars per month, Wells Fargo estimates. Uh, so whatever the numbers are, that doesn't really matter. The point is at the bottom here, uh, I put in the line, Costco normalizes gold buying. Because look, when you go to a place like Miles Franklin or any coin shop or an online coin retailer, those are really for gold bugs and they know what they're doing and they're comfortable going to a gold focused or a silver focused site and buying a bunch of coins. To a normie, that's a little bit strange and they're not comfortable doing it. But going to Costco, they go all the time. If they see gold bars there, it will normalize the purchase of gold in the eyes of the normies. And the normies are the main market here and they are what will bring gold up to about 30, 40,000 in the end game and silver to about a round of 15 to one ratio to wherever gold ends up trading to cover the Fed's liabilities on its balance sheet. Uh, we need to normalize the, the buying of gold and silver by the normies and Costco is a great place to do it. Uh, and now I, I'm posting a Twitter tweet thing, X, whatever that I put on uh, X, Twitter, and the responses. So I said, can any Costco members tell me the listed price of the one ounce PAMP gold bar? Uh, so I got a whole bunch of responses here. And one says, logged in online as a member, says product is not available with no price shown. And here it says, it says product not available. So here... David Hartley tweets back to me, radio, by which he meant Rafi, uh, because of autocorrect. And uh, so my name is Radio now. You can call me Radio Farber. That's perfectly fine. Radio Star. Here in UK, they don't have the Pamp One Ounce Bar for sale, but a 50 gram Baird & Co. bar is listed at 31 dollars pounds. Current spot price for 50 grams is 29.82, so I calculated that. That's a 4.6% premium on gold, and that's uh, pretty close to the 4.93% premium on the gold American Eagle. I think this is this is data from Atmex, if I'm not mistaken. The GCRU Gold Charts R Us takes it from there. So the premiums are about the same, a little bit lower on Costco than on other sites, um, but the pricing structure is uh, a lot more jittery because they sell at whatever price they list it at until they sell out and uh, they don't move every day with the spot price like um, like coin shops do when they advertise such and such percent over spot or over melt. Costco doesn't do that. They price their stock and then they sell out and then they price it again when they get more. You see here that transparent gold holdings, how are the, how are the paper gold funds doing? Oh, they're still falling. Uh, gold moving to new highs and new highs is not attracting the retail crowd, not in ETFs, not in other paper funds. This is still a banker war or a family office war. I don't know if central banks are involved in it or if options trading, some rumors are options trading in like gamma or delta hedging. I don't even know what that really is so much. Chris probably knows more about that than I do. But uh, this it's a banker war that's going on right now. It's not in the retail market yet. And Costco might change that, but we'll see. I wanted to put this chart out there. This is gold relative to the CRB, which I've shown before, but from a slightly different perspective. So I want to show you a long-term perspective from 1990 here. So 1990 to about 2006, gold relative to other commodities, gold's real purchasing power relative to other commodities is very, very stable from 1990, probably from about 1983 if we go all the way back, but I don't have data from that far. So for, for let's say let's say it was 86 so about 20 years, gold is very stable relative to other commodities. And then from 2006, that's when the bull market starts. And it goes until with some pullbacks, some short pullbacks, you could, you could call this a bear market fine, but let's just call it you know, a correction in a secular bull. And so the bull began in 2006 and it ended in 2016. Now, if it ended in 2016 and we're still at that same ratio, this was, I would just blame it on the lockdowns and, you know, lockdowns are going to bring commodity prices very, very low because you don't use commodities when you can't leave your house. 
uh, and then gold was gaining value relative to other commodities because we were in a monetary crisis. But if we just iron this out for a minute as some kind of insane spike from some crazy policy, then gold has been steady relative to other commodities since 2016. So we've been in a 10-year steady market. There's been no real bear market. We were in a steady market, then a 10-year bull market, and then a steady market for about uh, nine years now, since tw from 2016 until now. Uh, and we're going to head uh, to another uh, bull market in gold relative to commodities very soon, if we haven't even started already. And silver is going to so show you a similar chart, but a little bit more wobbly, obviously. Um, but in the end game, you know, silver is going to outpace gold as it always does towards the end of rallies. So we see here a very stable silver price relative to other, com relative to other commodities for the same time frame, nine, 1990 to 2006. And then a bull market that lasted until uh, 2011. And then well, fine, we can call this a bear market. And then we've been steady uh, from about 2013 to now. So for about 10, 11 years, we've been steady in silver relative to other commodities, more or less. But that's going to end if it hasn't already ended. This perspective also long term, just to give you an idea of where we are historically. So commodities never really recover. This is the same chart uh, inverted, I think. So gold relative to other commodities in 1980. And I put a tiny little line here, very thin line. So you can see, so this is the 1980 top in gold relative to commodities. So uh, the CRB relative to gold was at an all time low, meaning gold was at an all time high relative to commodities in 1980. And look at that we're pretty much at the same level. So commodities have never recovered uh, that well. I mean, they kind of recovered here in 2000. Yeah, so let's say 0.9 from about 0.4. So yeah, it doubled. They did recover a little bit, but we're back down to 1980 levels since around 2010 uh, in gold relative to commodities and also silver. Anyway, let's continue. I wanted to close this week's silver report off with the yen. The yen has broken um, the resistance at 150 through 153 is now above 153. So it's weakening relative to the dollar and the price of gold and silver in the yen is starting to really climb because it's climbing relative to the dollar and the dollar is climbing relative to the yen. So, you know, it's on one of those moving walkways at the airport where you walk really slowly and it feels like you're walking really fast. Uh, so the final support here for the yen is at 159.83. Here's the high from 1990. Uh, and uh, I think we're going to break that. The the thing is with the yen is this, and this is the final slide, final two slides, sorry, that uh, it, this graph of the red and the blue, it's the 10-year Japanese government bond rate versus the USD JPY, the Japan, Japanese yen relative to the dollar. So the higher the blue goes, the higher the yields go, and the higher the red goes, the weaker the yen is. So you can see they're correlated. As 10-year uh, rates go up, so the yen goes down, right? Up here means down because relative to how many yen does it cost to buy a dollar? So uh, we see that they're they're pretty much tied together here. That's because the Bank of Japan owns like half the Japanese government bond market. So they raise rates, the yen collapses. They lower rates, the yen collapses. There's nothing that can be done and everything will collapse relative to gold and silver. And here's the points that should be understood. We are turning dead man's curve and dead man's curve is from a road in uh, in Florida that I remember as a kid, 826, and there was a curve where it went from west to south, and it was a long curve, very, very uh, blunt uh, edge. And it took a while, maybe like a minute or two, to get around it. Uh, and it wasn't that treacherous, but if there was an accident there, you wouldn't see it because there was no visibility because of the curve. So you wouldn't be able to stop in advance and there'd just be huge pileups and things that happened a few times there. So that's where we're going uh, because we're turning the corner, the dead man's curve, from when higher interest rates mean lower consumer price inflation to when they mean higher consumer price inflation. That's because the central banks own the bonds that they're lowering the value of, which back the currencies that they're trying to increase purchasing power in, and it won't work. So here, first bullet point, when central banks own a high enough percentage of the bond market, or as a percentage of their balance sheet, I should say, then prices rise with interest rates. This is most evident in Japan, but it also applies to the dollar itself. 93% of the dollar is backed by treasuries and mortgage debt. The higher rates go, the lower the value of that 93% of the dollar's backing. Therefore, lower rates 
equals higher prices and higher rates also equals higher higher prices. There is no escape and that's it. In today's episode, we delved into Rafi Farber's analysis as he discussed the significant surge in gold and silver prices. Gold recently reached new all-time highs around $2,400 per ounce, while silver surpassed $29, inching closer to the crucial $30 threshold. Rafi drew parallels to the volatile market conditions of the late 1970s, suggesting that current trends might mirror those historic movements. Rafi also focused on inflation in his report. He highlighted a recent uptick in sticky price inflation, which includes prices that are slow to change. This slight increase could indicate sustained inflationary pressures similar to those seen in the 1970s, presenting a complex challenge for central banks trying to manage inflation without further destabilizing the economy. Additionally, Rafi touched on the escalating geopolitical tensions, specifically the potential threats from Iran towards Israel. He emphasized the broader implications such tensions could have on global stability, particularly given the significant role the U.S. dollar plays in international finance. This geopolitical instability could have far-reaching effects on the financial markets, especially in relation to gold and silver prices. Lastly, Rafi discussed the investment potential in the mining sector, particularly highlighting silver mining stocks, which he believes are currently undervalued. He pointed out Fortuna Silver Mines, noting its strong production performance and strategic debt reduction as positive indicators. Rafi also commented on the cultural shift towards normalizing gold purchases among the general public, which could further influence market dynamics and drive prices higher. As we wrapped up, these insights provided a broad overview of the factors currently shaping the precious metals market.